Did you know that there was a song created in England to warn kids to stay away from the country's first serial killer? Hello and welcome back or welcome to my channel. If you don't know what's going on here, I am a horror artist and I like to draw what I talk about in the videos. Now, nothing is meant to be uh, insensitive to the victims or the victims' families, but if you are a sensitive person, this one may upset you in some sort of way, so I honestly recommend not watching anything that is on my channel, especially not this one. With that being said, let's get on with the video. In today's video, I'm going to be talking about the Muffin Man. Do you know the Muffin Man? Sorry, I couldn't help myself. Every time I hear that, all I can think about is Gingy from Shrek. Now, this story has no known documentation, just word of mouth. So this just might be one hell of a disturbing urban legend. But the nursery rhyme, The Muffin Man, was apparently created from the 16th century murders to caution children from taking food or anything from strangers, but was only apparently first written in the 1800s. Now let's go for a little bit of a deep dive into the history of this serial killer. There was a baker in London named Frederick Thomas Linwood who lived on Drury Lane and guess what his nickname was? I'll give you three guesses and the first two don't count. That's right, the Muffin Man. He was apparently England's first serial killer between 1589 and 1598 and was also labelled the Drury Lane Dicer. Now let me tell you why this guy was a complete and utter piece of shit. Linwood was a baker, as I mentioned before, who would make, bake and sell muffins. These muffins weren't the kind that you see today. They were actually different types and more healthy breakfast muffins and sweet ones. Sounds pretty nice, huh? But he started getting angry at the amount of competition from other bakers, so he apparently killed seven competitors with a sharpened wooden spoon. Then this is where the story takes an even darker turn. Linwood then would set his sights on children. This sick fuck would place a muffin on the ground which was tied to a piece of string and when a child saw it and wanted it, Linwood would then pull the muffin along the ground back to the dark alley making sure the child followed. Once the child was out of sight, he bludgeoned them to death with a wooden spoon. Yeah, that's exactly what my thoughts were too, don't worry. I never thought a wooden spoon could do that kind of damage other than a sting and red mark left on your butt from when you were being a little shit when you were younger. Anyways, he apparently killed more than 15 children because he really didn't like children and they would visit his bakery and hang around for hours and this annoyed him and drove him crazy as they were hyper after eating so much sugar. Now what he did with the kids' bodies is not mentioned in any of the research that I did, but maybe he would do a savoury muffin filled with, you guessed it, the local children. Maybe he did a sweeting Todd and fed the children back to the parents and the local people. Yummy. But I did read some versions of the story that did suggest that the Muffin Man did bake his victims into the food that he made. I know that these children back then in this time and in, in this century were probably pretty lax, but I'll tell you what, I wouldn't be chasing no food that was being pulled across the gross ground by a piece of string. So as we are not too sure if this story is real, let's move on to the documented first serial killer in England of Mary Ann Cotton. Now there is a lot to unpack here and I don't want this video to go huge, huge amounts of you know time. So if you really want to find out more about this particular story that I'm going to talk about, do your own deep dive and grab all the detailed information. Now I'm going to be mentioning, you know, key details but if you want to find out all the nitty-gritty stuff on each key detail do your own research. Mary Ann Cotton was born on the 31st of October 1832 at Low Morsley, County Durham. When she was eight years old her family moved to Merton. In 1842 her father fell to his death down a 150 metre mine shaft he was working at in which his body was then brought back to them in a sack. So because they were staying in a miner's cottage, Mary, her mother, brother and sister had to move out due to his death. 
Her mother then went on to remarry in 1843, who was also another minor. When Mary turned 16, she moved away to become a nurse at South Hetton in the home of Edward Potter, who was the manager of Merton Colliery. Then, after three years, she moved back to her stepfather's place and became a dressmaker. Husband number one. In 1852, 20-year-old Mary married colliery labourer William Mowbray and moved to southwest England. They allegedly had eight to nine children, but because registry of births and deaths wasn't compulsory until 1874, there was no records, but apparently they all died. And the only known child registered was their daughter, Margaret Jane, in 1856 in St. German. They moved back to North East England and Isabella was born in 1858. Then in 1860, Margaret Jane died. Mary gave birth to another daughter and named her Margaret Jane in 1861 and then gave birth to a son, John Robert Williams, in 1863, but he died the following year from gastric fever. In 1865, her husband William died from an intestinal disorder and the family was insured so Mary collected a payout of £35, which is equivalent to £3,560 in this day, and also claimed a payout for the death of her son, John Robert William, of £25. Husband number two. Mary Ann moved to Seaham Harbour after William's death and got into a relationship with Joseph Natras. The second daughter named Margaret Jane was only three and a half years old when she died of typhus fever, leaving her with only one child, Isabella, of apparently nine children that were supposedly born. Mary decided to go to Sutherland and work at the House of Recovery for the Cure of Contagious Fever Dispensary and Human Society. What a tongue twister. She sent Isabel to live with her mother. She then met engineer George Wood and they got married in 1865. George then suffered from bad health problems with his intestines and died in 1866. Apparently, George had been ill for a while, but the doctor he was seeing said he died too sudden. This is when it was ruled death via cholera and typhoid. So once again, Mary collected some more insurance money from his death. Husband number three. In 1866, James Robinson hired Mary to be his housekeeper as his wife had just died. One month after Mary started working for him, James's baby John died of gastric fever. So James turned to Mary for comfort and what do you know? She fell pregnant. Then Mary's mother fell ill with hepatitis, so Mary quickly went back to see her. Her mother was beginning to recover, but all of a sudden she started experiencing stomach pains. She died in 1867 at just 54 years old, nine days after Mary Ann arrived. Now, Isabel had to go back and live with Mary Ann. Not long after moving back with her mother, Isabel fell ill with severe stomach pains and died. She received a very good payout for the death of Isabel, just over five pounds. In 1867, James married Mary Ann and they gave birth to their child, Margaret Isabel. And then she died not long after from falling ill. They then had a second child named George, born in 1869. James started to get suspicious of his wife, insisting to always insure the family and especially on James himself. She was also stealing money from him. James threw her out on her ass and got custody of George. Husband number four. Marianne was living on the streets until her friend Margaret Cotton introduced her to her brother, Frederick Cotton, who lived in Northumberland, and he was a widower as well, and he had already lost two of his four children also. Then in 1870, Margaret died of stomach problems too. Margaret was also looking after Frederick's two remaining children. Frederick and Marianne got together and what do you know again? She was preggers with another child. Now what's that baby number 12? In 1870, Frederick and Marianne got married and their son was born 1871 named Robert. 
she then found out that her ex-husband James Robinson was only living up the road about 40 kilometers from her so she reached out and rekindled their romance but then convinced her new family to move closer to him. At the end of 1871, Frederick died of gastric fever. The Lover Mary Ann became a nurse again for a man recovering from smallpox called Richard Quick Man, who specialised in breweries. They soon became entangled and Mary Ann became pregnant with baby number 13. Now Frederick Jr., now, Frederick Jr., who was the child of Frederick and his dead wife, as I mentioned before, then died in 1872, followed by Robert soon after. Now, James became ill with gastric fever and died just after changing his will, as suggested by Marianne. After this, this is when Marianne's sinister life started to catch up with her. A parish official named Thomas Riley asked her for her help to nurse a sick woman with smallpox. She then started to complain to Riley that the last remaining son of Frederick's seven-year-old Charles Edward was in the way. Then Charles Edward became sick and she turned around and said that he won't live long like the rest of the Cottons and I won't be troubled much longer. He also apparently was a reason that she couldn't marry or remarry to Manning. This spiked suspicion in Riley when five days later, Charles Edward died. Riley went straight to the doctor in the village to hold off on the death certificate until Charles's body was investigated. After the death, Mary Ann got a visit by the insurance officer and no money would be paid out until the death certificate was done. An inquest was held and the jury found natural causes and Mary Ann said that she only fed him arrowroot to ease his illness. She said that Riley was trying to ruin her by these murder accusations because he was jealous that she declined his advances. Then all the info got out about all the deaths of her husband's children, mother and friend, and that she moved around North England a lot, and the nail in her coffin was that the deaths were all the same. Gastric fever. A doctor named William Byers Kilburn kept samples from Charles Edward and tested them. And guess what they came back with? Arsenic. Apparently after the authorities were notified after Charles's death, they exhumed James and two other cotton children and they tested positive for arsenic. Mary Ann was finally, after all these years of killing, arrested and charged with murder. The trial was delayed until after she gave birth to the 13th and final child, which she named Margaret Edith Quick Manning Cotton. Mary Ann's trial began in March 1873 and they mulled over the possibility of the poisonings being from the Cotton's house, the wallpaper painted in Paris green. Now I've got a whole video on Paris green if you want to know all about that I will leave it in the end card at the end of this video. But because there was arsenic liquids and powders she could have easily obtained at a chemist, this was the likely cause of Charles's death. Apparently during her trial Mary Ann appeared cold and reserved showing no emotions. The trial came back with a guilty verdict and on the 24th of March 1873 she was hung by William Calcraft. She apparently died slowly due to the rope being too short and the trapdoor being too high so there was no sudden jerk and drop which plays a part in her neck not snapping but causing her to strangulate to death. Rumours say that this was done on purpose. Out of Mary Ann's supposedly 13 children, only Margaret Edith and George from James Robinson survived and lived full lives. She was definitely the problem if these two lived after they got away from her. Wow, what a roller coaster of such a sadistic bitch. Now, what are your thoughts on this first ever serial killer being a woman? Now, I always thought that the first serial killer would have been a man, but yeah, no, it was actually a woman. So, interesting. 
Now, if you've got any other information on this crazy ass bitch that I didn't mention in this video, or if you just want to add your, you know, your comments below, by all means, knock yourself out in the comment section. Um, this was just an absolute mind fuck of an investigation into this woman and just all the loops and, and everything that she went through and to give birth to that to so-called that many children there was definitely something wrong with her now the illustration that i decided to do for the video today was of a woman basically doing like a little uh what's that what's that pirouette whatever you if that's what you call it i have no idea um, you know, just uh, being happy that she's uh, killing off her children and you'll see that there's an arsenic bottle with all these fumes coming out and she's put arsenic in the bottle that she's been feeding the babies and she's already got one in her fingers and she's just ready to drop it into the bucket with four other ch well three other children one's older the two are babies and then you'll see like a hand like of like one of her husband's just I thought I would add that in there just to sort of create like a horrible scenario that this is what this woman was doing she was just getting off on killing everybody killing all her children killing her husbands to basically get insurance money so yeah this one's just a bit more of a simpler illustration um but yeah I uh it was the first thing that came to my mind when I thought of this uh, case as I was doing the research. So anyway, that is it from me. If you like this kind of content, like and subscribe, dislike it, couldn't care less. It all goes towards my algorithm for other people to find me and watch whatever's left of this video if there's anything much left. And I will see you guys in the next one. Bye.